Dear people, Shweizer Betamuz, you're already at the beginning of this. Most of you are in the beginning of the Ta'anit, and we're towards the end, so I'm very tired uh, and exhausted. So please excuse me, and we'll start straight with Megillat Echa. We're talking about the acrostic form. I don't know, I don't remember if this was the title I gave you, uh, Jesse, but this is the one we're going to do more or less. Um, do you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, perfect. You see it, but okay, now you see it, yeah? Okay, so there's a very interesting feature in the book of Echa, and that is that uh, the book, all the four chapters of Echa are in acrostic form. So let me just introduce, the, introduce this shortly to you. Probably you're aware of this, but I'm not sure that all the details of this feature is clear to all of us. Let's just see Perek Aleph, for instance, you see, Pasuk Aleph starts with Echa, Aleph, Pasuk Bet begins with Bachot, Tifke, Balayla. And so we have 22 verses in uh, Echa, Perek Aleph, all of them in the alphabetic order, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, and so on. This is Perek Aleph. If we go on to Perek Bet, same thing. We have uh, uh, Shalom Eliot, uh, Echa, Perek Bet. Again, uh, acrostic uh, form, Echa Ya'iv Be'apo, Aleph, Bila, Adonai Velo Hamal, Gada Bachori Af, Darach Kashto Ke'oyev, you see Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Daled, all the way to the end, to the letter Taf. There's only one difference in between chapter one and chapter two, that in chapter two, three, and four, okay, we already mentioned this, the order of the letters is not Ein and Pei, as we have this in the order of the alphabet today, and, and in Perek Aleph. In Perek Bet, Gimel, and Daled, in chapters 2, 3, and 4, the order is uh, Pei and then Ein. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to discuss this today, but uh, please note this uh, before you. And then we have Perek Gimel. Chapter 3 is the most unique, and that is that um, it's not 22 verses as the rest of the chapters, but actually 66 verses. Um, and each three verses begin with the uh, corresponding alphabetic order. So you see here, Ania Gever, Otina Hag, Achbiyashuv, three verses starting with Aleph, three verses starting with Bet, three verses with Gimel, and so on till the end of the chapter. By the way, the chapter is not longer than chapters one and two. Okay, let me just go back to chapter two, for instance. If you see chapter two, each, uh, each stanza, you have uh, three lines. So in chapter three, the length of each verse is a third of the length of the verses in chapter two. This is just some te technicality. So chapters one, th one two, and three, or are, uh, all are in acrostic form, uh, same length. You have the intensity of the of the acrostic form in, cha in chapter three, as I just presented to you. Chapter four, each verse is has two lines as opposed to chapter chapters one, two, and three. Uh, again, uh, the, the the chapter is acrostic form. Again, also the pay precedes the ein. Okay, chapter five has 22 verses. However, it is not an acrostic form. It doesn't have an alphabetic order. Uh, the Chachamim regarded chapter five to be an acrostic. The different uh, Midrashim saying that you have uh, seven alphabets in the book of Echa. Uh, the seven alphabets, then we have three in chapter three, uh, and then we have Four, uh, in, fourth in chapter one, fifth in chapter two, chapter four, uh, uh, six, and then apparently where's the seventh? The seventh is, to, is regarded as uh, chapter five. But even though it is considered to be a part of the pattern of the acrostic form, it does not have an alphabetic order. Not at all. And there's not the, the different attempts to find any kind of acrostic in the chapter, there is none. Okay, if you just read Zechor, Shema Elanu, Zayn, Nun, 
Yud, Mem, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So there is no acrostic, but it does, con uh, it is uniform to uh, with the rest of the chapters in that it has 22 verses. Uh, the question that I want to deal today with is why? Why do we have acrostic form in the book of Echa? What is the meaning of it? Um, obviously, if, if the author wrote um, the chapters in, in acrostic form, he had some kind of intention behind uh, um, the attempt. Obviously, it's much more difficult to write anything in an acrostic form. You have, to, you have to be very strict with what you're writing. And uh, the question is why? And uh, the question why should be a, a triple. We have to ask why is there an acrostic form in the book of Echa altogether? And then why do we have a, a triple acrostic in chapter three? And why does the alphabetic acrostic disappear in chapter five, even though there's still, um, alphabet, there's still 22 verse, verses? So these are the main questions we will try to address. So first, uh, the best thing to do is to uh, turn to our uh, Chachamim, and this was already addressed in uh, Midrash Echa Rabba. Uh, you have it in English, I will read it in Hebrew. Lama ne'emra megilat kenot be'alef bet, kedei sheyu nigrasin b'fi hamekonenim. Yes, as we know, only in three weeks from now, we will read Megilat Echa. Um, it, it's quite logical that that Megillat Echau used to be read uh, after the first temple, but you didn't have Chumashim, Sidurim to read it from. So you had some kind of, of aid to remember the, uh, the different kinot. So it was written in, in, in alphabetic order uh, in order to remember what, uh, what verse precedes uh, another verse. And especially when we had, when some claim that there's not a specific um, thematic order in the keynote, then the, you will have the form, the acrostic form, to help us and an aid to recite the keynote. Uh, this, however, does not really explain the feature of the alphabetic acrostic in Megillat Echa, uh, and that we see this in two points. First of all, if this is the reason, then why would uh, chapter three be a triple acrostic? Okay, we have uh, one acrostic in chapters one, two, and four. Why would it be the same form in chapter three? So this explanation does not express, uh, explain the uniqueness of chapter three. But even more severe is chapter five. Okay, because chapter five also is recited in the keynote. And here we have 22 verses. What happens here? What happens with the acrostic form that is not, does not appear in chapter 5? So this explanation does not, uh, does not really give reason to the uh, variations of the acrostic form in Echa. Um, another explanation is this one, also in Midrash Echa Rabbah. Davar acher, ani amarti levarcham me'alef ve'ataf. Okay, and this, this is very known, especially to, uh, uh, to people living in Anglo-Saxon countries where you have the term A to Z, right? You even have that booklet that used to be used once uh, with the names of the, of the streets of the city where you used to live. And then you have A to Z. A to Z used to be all the streets of the town, of the city, right? Uh, so this is already appears in, in the Tanakh, A to Z, me'alef ve'ataf, as used also in Hebrew, that means a sense of completeness. So you have the first opinion, I, uh, uh, I wish to bless them, im uh, telechu, do you see that im telechu begins with the word, with the letter alef, im telechu, ad komemiyut, and the the the, um, uh, the list of of uh, curses towards the people of Israel that will not keep the Torah, and that ends with the word komemiyut with the letter taf me'alef ve'ataf ve'em sarichu ve'laku. They sinned and they were punished from A to Z. That means 
a completeness of sin and a completeness of punishment. We can see also the rest of the opinions here. The Torah is written from Aleph and Taf. That means that they sinned from Aleph to Taf, from A to Z, a completeness of sin. That's why the temple was destroyed, and therefore also they should be comforted. Uh, in a complete form from Aleph to Taf, and that's why we have Megillat Echa, Me'alef Ve'ataf. So this is a, a very well-spread opinion. This appears also in the Parshanut, in the, in the medieval Parshanim, and uh, very much adopted even by modern uh, commentators, not necessarily Jewish, that adopted this very strongly. However, the same criticism we had on the former opinion also uh, applies to this one because if we have the the um, uh, idea of completeness of sin completeness of punishment completeness of of nechama um, uh, then uh, we should have the same uh, uh, the same for the same form also in chapter five this explanation these explanations do not explain the uniqueness of chapter five or even the uniqueness of chapter three that has a triple acrostic. So this is these are the main opinions that are in, in our Parshanut with, with the Chachamim and also the explanation mainly adopted in modern research. I do not have time to uh, um, uh, to do to bring more explanations, but I would like to present one um, one opinion that is presented by Rabbi Epstein, a modern uh, commentator, uh, wrote Torah Tenima. Uh, again, I will read in Hebrew. Whoever prefers, you can follow in the English. Devar Pele. Okay, it's a wonder. Ki gam be'et she'adam nafsho maralo. When a person is bitter, ve'kulo omer tsar ve'yagon, u'metzia kol nehi ve'yelala, u'vokhe u'mekonen al shivro ve'al asono. Okay. A person is in a state of devastation. He explained this to a different feature that, that, that why is it written Rabbati with a Yud? So he says this is for the, this is part of the beauty of the, of the song, but I'm just applying this, this, uh, this idea to the acrostic form, and he says it, it is a wonder why someone that would be in a, in a, a, a state of devastation, of death, of of the churban of the of the temple, then why would the 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 author uh, try to present his sayings, his poetry in in an acrostic form? He's not saying acrostic form. I'm applying this. To what Epstein is saying. Sharei kol ha Megillah zot tsar yagon vapach nefesh kol nei vela la afal pichen mishtadel lefaer alashon. He is trying to beautify the language uleyapot ha melitza. Ki kafish ekatam no beim ayudim min arabati. Let's leave this. He neze meid al rikshotav shel adam baetahi. So he says this. This testifies to the feelings of the person at that time. That with all his sorrow and worry, the soul within him responds to life. Or in Hebrew, it's much beautiful. It, it's 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 uh, it's nicer. <speaking in Hebrew> Saying, and this some modern uh, um, commentators adopt this type of approach. Saying that with describing the devastation, with describing the um, the churban, the the destroying of the temple, then still there is a sense of 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 life. It's not everything is dead, not everything is destroyed. How does he pronounce this when he's describing his words? He's saying how everything is ruined. He is saying in the form that there is a sense of of uh, of order, of creativity, and you see here the, there's a tension between the form and content. This is what Rabbi Epstein is saying, and I would like to take this a step forward and say the following. 
Um, many modern scholars today, this is a very recent tendency among scholars. Once scholars try to see the theology of the Book of Lamentations. Today, uh, mostly scholars are talking about, about um, the fact that Lamentations is really uh, um, uh, representing one's inner life. And it's the reason it was written is not to convey message, but rather to express feelings. Uh, I would say that this is the way most of us, most uh, Jewish believers that recite the book of Echa in our synagogues, this is what we think of Echa. Hardly any of us learn Megillat Echa. All of us recite it or really lament it in On Tisha B'Av. Uh, we do this the same way that we lament the different uh, keynote that were written throughout the Middle Ages by Chachamim, uh, uh, lamenting the first temple, the second temple, and many Ashkenazi Jews also, also we have uh, their lamentations on different events in Europe at the time. Um, what is the purpose of the laments? The purpose is to lament, to cry, to cause someone to, uh, to feel the situation not to think about it, but really to feel it. And what we try to do, or we, fe we feel that we, we gain something on Tisha B'Av, if we go to, to our synagogues, to the shul, to the knis, and we feel, we feel attached to it, we feel sorry, we feel that we cry. And we have even some chazanim, this is especially known amongst our Iraqi Jews, that try to cause the people, the congregation to cry while they recite the lamentations. Okay, this is the atmosphere. And I would say that this is the aim, this is what we think the aim of Echa is. And what I would try to, uh, what I uh, think is that, um, like most of the Tanakh, the same is also uh, applied to the book of Echa, and that is like most, like all the Tanakh is meant to convey meaning, to express an ideology, a theology, a teaching, the same is with Megillat Echa. And I would like to say the following, because there is the danger that we will tend to lament lamentations, to cry when we lament, and not to think about it, then the book was written in acrostic form. The acrostic form applies to the intellect, to our, to our minds, and not to our feelings. We do not cry in form. We cry, we burst crying, right? When something is in form, this is something that is done by our uh, intellectual abilities to write in formation. And I think that the tension between the acrostic form that is very fixed and between the um, uh, the content of the book that is very uh, that that um, turns to our to our feelings. This tension was the intention of the author, the author of Echa, in order to say that when we recite lamentations, when we lament it, when we read it in the synagogues, we would should come prepared to the book and also think about it because it conveys message. Uh, in my opinion, this is the main aim of Echa. But now I should be honest and try to explain why there's a triple acrostic in chapter three and there's no alphabetic acrostic in chapter five. To do this, I have 10 minutes, uh, almost 10 minutes, to explain um, very quickly the main idea of the book of Echa. So, um, let me just point out that the chapter three, you have a triple acrostic because the theology, the ideology that is conveyed is most uh, intensively uh, uh, appears in chapter three. Chapter three is meant to, uh, to express the main message of the book. And indeed it does. Um, the first part of the book, the first part of the, of Echa, describes 
the situation in which the, uh, the author, the people are in. And the situation is that they feel disconnected from Hashem. If you look at chapter 8, gam, in verse 8, gam ki akva shavea satam tefilati. Even if I cry out to God, then he blocked my prayer, satam tefilati. There is no other place in the whole Tanakh where you find the term satam tefilati, satam that he blocked my prayer. It doesn't appear anywhere else. Anywhere else. It will appear that, that God did not hear him. Veloshama. Okay, but the, the, the prayer comes to Hashem, but then Hashem decides not to listen to the one that prays to him. In this case, there is no ability. Gam kiazak v'ashave, he does not pray to God. And if you look carefully, I only pre uh, presented a selection of verses. He does not even mention the name of God in the first 18 verses. Who did? He doesn't mention the name of God. He's talking about him. The one that did everything was Hashem, but he doesn't, he doesn't mention God's name. Just to present the, the feeling of the people, they felt that the Galut was the final stage, that the people were ejected before God and they will not be redeemed forever. And this is why it says in, in verse 6, Bamachshakim hoshivani kemete olam. He put me in darkness, he sat me in darkness, kemete olam, as the dead forever. And the, the simple question is, what does it mean, kemete olam? Are there metim, are there dead that are not forever? Obviously, he's talking about the living, about the people that live in Galut, that feel Mete Olam. What does that mean? It means that they feel that they will never be uh, redeemed from Galut to Eretz Israel forever. Ke Mete Olam. And or chapter, or verse 18, the Omar avad nitzri v'tochalti me'ashem, he feels that there will be no, there is no hope, no hope that he will be saved from God. And this is really appears very strongly in verse 31. Kilo yiznach le'olam Adonai. Uh, against the feeling that, that the author feels in verses, uh, in the beginning of, of the chapter, then the teaching is, the teaching is, Kilo yiznach le'olam Adonai. As opposed to what the people felt, that, that God forsake the people forever, then the teaching is, God will not leave his people, will not forsake them forever. And this is the main verse of the whole book of Lamentations, the whole book of Echa. As opposed to the people that, that thought, that felt that God left them forever, then And indeed, in the, in the last part of chapter 3, again there is a lament, there is again a complaint, and, the, and again, the author is expressing his grief. But this time, he is turning his grief to Hashem. Verse 50, Pasuk uh, Nun. Or let's do in 44, You covered yourself with a cloud so that the prayer will not be uh, uh, transformed to you. But then he's speaking to Hashem as opposed to the first part of the Kina. And then, Karati Shincha, verse 55, Karati mi as opposed to the first part that he did not cry to God at all, and this time he is crying to God, Karati Shincha Adonai mi The whole last part, Koli Shamata al Talem Oznecha, Karafta Beyom Ekraeka Amarta al Tira, Rafta Adonai Ribe Nafshi, everything is is presented to Hashem. And this is the main shift in the book of Echa. From despair of the people, the despair is that they feel disconnected, rejected from Hashem. The main message of the book is that indeed the situation is, is very difficult, but the people are not rejected 
the people are still the chosen people. The people felt that they were rejected, that they are no longer the chosen people, and Echa comes to teach the people that they are still the chosen ones. And going back to the acrostic form, chapters one, two, one and two express the grief, express that there's no prayer to God. Chapter three, we find the shift and the, the result is in chapter five. And I would like to compare chapter five to chapter one. And with this, I will end this very short, short session. The first in chapter one, you see the crying and the, the key words in chapter one, there is no comforter for the people. Here for Jerusalem. Again, in chapter 16, I'm crying for this. I'm crying. There is no comfort for me. And when, or when it says in chapter, in verse 17, What does peresat Sion beyadea? It means uh, uh, taking your hands and uh, pointing them to, to heaven. Peresat Sion beyadea. This is a form of praying, but en menachemla. So when it says en menachemla in this verse, who is it referring to? It is referring to Hashem. As we find in the book of Yeshayahu, who is the great comforter for the people? Anochi, Anochi, hu menachemchem. God is the comforter of Israel. But in Echa, the people do not feel that God is the comforter because they feel rejected. The shift occurs in chapter 5. And chapter 5 is indeed not a lament, but a prayer. How does it open? I don't have it before you, but remember the opening of the chapter. Zechor Adonai Mehayalanu. This is the opening of a prayer to Hashem. And this is the ending of chapter five, the prayer. Ata Adonai Leolam Teshev, Kisacha Ledor Vador. And then the, 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 the author approaches Hashem. Lama la netzach tishkachenu ta'azvenu le'orech yamim. The feeling that God forsake the people forever is shifted now, not forever, but this is a very long time. Lama lam netzach tishkachenu. But now this is in the form of prayer. And what is the prayer? Hashivenu Adonai elecha venashuva chadesh yamenu kekedem. Hashivenu Hashem elecha venashuva. This is not chazara bitshuva. It's not let us repent. Hashivenu Hashem elecha venashuva means totally something else. We are now disconnected from God. Return us to you. Accept us. Embrace us. Make us again. Make us again part of your people. And the, the verse ends, the, the chapter ends, Ki ma'os me'astanu katzavta alenu ma'ad me'od. Ma'os, the Hebrew, the, the modern Hebrew, um, is confusing. Ma'os is not... Uh, despise. It's not nimasli. It's not something that you uh, that you dislike. Maos in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, means the opposite of bachar, bachar, and the opposite is maas. Ki maos mastanu, because if you rejected us, so that you should read this. Hashivenu Adonai elecha v'nashuva chadesh yamenu kekedem ki maos maos matzanu. Even though you have rejected us, then please return us to you. So, chapter five is a prayer to, to Hashem, a prayer that, uh, and I called my book uh, that I wrote on this, that Lamentations Echa is from despair, the people that would despair because they felt that God rejected them, and it, it shifts into a prayer to Hashem that they, will, that they feel that now they can turn to Him and hope that, will return, that the God will return them to Him. So I really urge you, uh, we're uh, soon approaching Tisha B'Av, when we will recite the book of Echa. But before we recite it, I think it's an excellent idea to learn it, to learn it, to read it carefully, and to understand what the deep meanings of the book is. Thank you very much. And uh, my time is over. And it's my great honor 
I'm privileged to introduce Rabbi Shimon Aluf. Um, I don't really have to introduce him at all because he's well known to everyone here. Uh, the Rabbi of Ahava of Achva uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, let me just uh, say one sentence, not to embarrass him too much. Uh, Rabbi Aluf is one as a remnant of uh, the older generation of the Sefaradi Chachamim, that he masters Halakha in Talmud, but not only that, but also Midrash, Agada, Piyutim, Jewish philosophy, Tanakh, Parshanut, and it's really uh, um, a great privilege that we have him with us, that, he's, uh, that we are able to learn from him uh, from all aspects of Torah. Bechavod, Chacham Aluf.